I've opened for this man in several different places, in Washington and in Killarney and in Callum, and I never tire of listening to him. Um, he needs no introduction, but safe, we can say this, that probably nobody has thought as deeply about the purpose and the philosophy of parliamentary buildings and their architectural realization than Brian O'Connell. He has had all the honors that Ireland can provide and a few honors that other people can, outside Ireland can provide as well. But he is certainly a, a deeply uh, knowledgeable person in the area of parliaments and how they function and their architectural manifestations. And without further ado, I'll introduce Brian O'Connell. Thank you very much for that, Dennis. I didn't recognize myself, and so I was waiting for somebody else to stand up. Uh, however, this is the first opportunity I have to use my new word. Uh, and so in introducing this and looking at the level of knowledge and scholarship that I see around me, and particularly having regard to David Griffin's seminal work in relation to Leinster House, it's going to be very difficult to avoid being psittacaceous. Now, I'm sure there's nobody in this room knows what psittication is. Hmm? Yes. Who, who said that? Excellent. We have one person. Psittacos is the Greek word for a parrot. And apparently it translates into English that any parrot-like or repetitive uh, statement would be regarded as psittacaceous. But, however, I'm going to try and avoid that. And I'm going to use, I won't altogether avoid it, but I'm going to use Dennis's very excellent and I think clever reference to three lives, that Leinster House has had three lives. And I think that points to something, that a building can have a life. And I think that's part of the essence and part of the answer I'm going to give to a question I was asked as to why do you have to kill buildings and replace them? Why can they not transform? Why can they not transcend? Why can they not evolve? I believe they can, and I will hope to demonstrate that in this particular case, Leinster House has transposed, it has transcended, it has evolved from being a private residence to being a cultural centre of a, of, of, of a broadening electorate, uh, which I think, again, is very important. The statutory framework is a track that can be followed here, and it's a track a little bit like the fixed points on an ordnance map where there are markers. You can actually measure between markers. And I think the statutes are markers because they have an absolute quality about them. They have a very clearly defined status uh, and that they don't rely on opinion. They rely on what they state. And therefore you can track a lot of public activity by reference to statutes. So what I would hope to do is to demonstrate very broadly uh, my sort of my view of Leinster House, um, and that in that I, I would hope to demonstrate that it has successfully it has successfully moved from its first life to its third life, and that it's part of the essence of that that everything that happened in its first and second life, in retrospect, is anticipatory of its third life. So everything that caused it to be there now perhaps came from a separate genesis, but it transformed. And so it was never the invention of the new, it was the transformation of the old. And if conservation, architectural conservation is anything, it is the transformation of the old to allow it to evolve into the new. And it's only when it cannot be new that it must be delegated to being either removed in its entirety because it's no longer relevant and is obstructing something better. Or alternatively, it's fixed as a monument, which is in fact the word monument coming from the, from the Latin to remember. It's something that we remember. And if we have no memory, we have no personality. We as a nation remember things that are national and common to us, and that makes us a nation. A new nation, and that was one of America's problems when it was founded, when Washington founded the Federation of the United States, was it had no common memory. It had associations, diverse associations, and it had to slowly build up. And this is why Jefferson locked it back into Rome, that in fact, this was the first real republic since the fall of Rome. 
Uh, and therefore, if you look at the classical approach to America, and particularly Jefferson's view of it, not so much Washington's view of it, that in fact he wished Rome to be reborn and that it was Rome coming to life again in America. This is not a transition. This is not a, this is not a transition of a place. This, in fact, is claiming a place and removing it somewhere else and using it as the starting point for something new. So it's against that broad background that I want to look at, um, at Leinster House and look at, as Dennis has rightly referred to, its third life. But it will be necessary, in some measure, to look at the anticipatory factors that made, it, made its third life possible. They derived from its first and second lives. So before going there, what I want to go to first is the typology of parliaments. Ultimately, it will become the parliament, the seat of parliament for the Irish people. Uh, and I'm talking now, of course, by the Irish people as being the, the, the southern Irish people. Uh, it reflects them. The Irish people is a, is a people as a whole. There's still a division which dates back to uh, previous times. It has its historic origins. We're not going to go into that and that we're dealing largely, uh, because the 1920, the Government of Ireland Act 1920, in fact, divided the country effectively into two. It envisaged it as a federation of two states in which there would be, if like, common ground. It looked at the model of the United States, and it had hoped there would be a southern and northern parliament, and that they would merge together in a federal parliament, and that they would assign powers certain powers to that federal department. That never happened. And we look at why it never happened uh, and what happened in its lieu. But what is left in its lieu, in fact, are two parliament buildings in Ireland of the present day. There is Leinster House and there is Stormont. They are both valid parliaments. They are both founded from very good historical origins and they both in the modern world have a, have a separate identity even though they lock together two disparate elements within one people, the Irish people. So moving from there, uh, it's the one on the left, isn't it? Or the one on the right, sorry. Yeah, the first thing I just want to mention here is the approach to parliaments. When architects take on a role uh, to design a building, the first thing they will look to is the functional requirement. The aesthetic of a building comes at the end of a process. And if a building doesn't pass the test of adequate functionality, it doesn't even get off the ground. It's once it's off the ground, how high can it fly? Uh, and how can you bring these um, qualities to it, which are qualities of human feeling and instinct. They don't belong necessarily to the grounds of reason, but they start with reason. And the reason why you have a building is important. It must work. So the question is, how do parliaments work? And then if we go back to, oh, sorry, the wrong, I pressed the wrong button. I go back to that one, yeah. Um, if we go to this one here, we start off with what we would call the amphitheater pattern. And if we look at the first sign of this in the Western democracy, we find it in the Picts in Athens. We find that in the side of, of the, 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 the mountain upon which the Acropolis stands, carved into that is a thing called the Pix. And it's a series of benches that come down to a rostrum. Why did, they, why did they form it in that way? Athens, of course, was not a democracy. It was an oligarchy by our standards. They invented the word democracy because the electorate was very narrow. It was only men over the age of 30 of a certain standing who could in fact be members of parliament. All other peoples, including the entire slave population or working, working class of Athens had no role in it. So in reality, it was a small group of people who were in power, who in fact made decisions. The way they did it was this. I suppose you can ask the question, why? Why did the amphitheater, why did the amphitheater work? Well, it worked largely because two things were important. One was vision, and the other was acoustics. This is where history defeats us, because we tend to think today of me talking here. I'm being amplified. You possibly couldn't hear me if you were a certain distance further back. 
So there's a difficulty with regard to hearing up to the middle of the 20th century. And therefore, a series of devices must be developed, both in terms of plan, form, and section, whereby sound will travel. So the first thing is I must obey the laws of sound. And sound moves in a cone. It moves in a rising cone, a cone that has an outer curved edge to it and that rises. And that in those circumstances, what better model can I create to receive sound than a semicircle, uh, which in fact responds exactly to the sound? It also means that the time the sound takes to reach me is roughly equidistant, which means I can control reverberation. Now, reverberation wasn't reverberation is where the sound bounces back, uh, and you get confused waves. You get the second sound coming back and merging with the first. And the two then ultimately just turn into a jumble. They lose their original characteristics. So what I must do is control reverberation. I want long reverberation times in the case of music. I want short reverberation times in the case of voice. Uh, and therefore, cathedrals and so on will largely be unacceptable. They'd be great for choirs, but they're not much good for, for preaching. Uh, by the same token, the amphitheatre is perfect for preaching, but not great for choirs. So I think from that point of view, we have, we have this idea. The, the, other, the other thing that's, that's in, significant about that is you've got the speaker here and you've got the sound moving slightly upwards, which is exactly where you want to get it at its maximum. You also have people who must now see the speaker. So how better than to have them layered? So they're overlooking the heads of the others as the others come down. So to put them into an amphitheatrical form is in fact an extremely efficient way of communicating where the speaker, primarily where the speaker is at the center. And that it was the practice, the Roman Senate followed exactly the same pattern. The, uh, the, the, what the Curia Julia, as it's known, the Roman Senate is in fact a similar pattern and not at all dissimilar from our uh, our, our current Senate in Leinster House. Um, so it, the, it's the ideal objective. However, another pattern develops, which develops in the northern races, mainly in the kind of the, the, the Anglo-Saxon races. Uh, and that effectively is to use cathedrals because they are stable buildings. They are the only buildings that are in fact built on a scale where it's appropriate to get a large number of people together. So you go to the cathedral, you also have the church, which acts as a very significant element in government, uh, and that you have then this idea of having the representatives, as you begin to have representatives, you have them on either, so either side of a center line here. And that because you then move into the territory of groups of people, interests, you have the landed interests who in fact are the Tories, you have those who want to get the landed power, who are the Whigs, uh, and that they effectively are two opposing elements. They will fight each other. Therefore, we were saying earlier that, um, <clears throat> that Parkinson, who wrote the famous book on Parkinson's law, uh, comically refers to this, the British saw politics as a game, where you, you cheered for your own side and you booed the other side, and it didn't really matter what they were saying. You know, and of course he was being facetious there. But the, you can see there that this is adversarial. This is not. This is, if, if, if you like, this is in agreement. This is adversarial in its idea. And if you look at this pattern, this is the pattern you see in the House of Commons today, which is the choir pattern coming from the choirs of the cathedrals. You then have a compromise on that. You have the octagon. And the octagon actually is not particularly good for acoustic purposes because it, it too clearly defines the reflective surfaces and you tend to get points within it where one sound cancels the other. So you get deaf points, certain seats in an octagon. You're actually not going to hear anything. It's going to be silent because the sounds are cancelling each other out. And this is pre-amplification. Um, however, it does allow for the adversarial process by having your speaker in the centre yeah, and by having your, your two opposing leaders on either side. Uh, and you have then the observers, such as they are, in the centre or on a gallery. Now, these are the three formats. Um, I'm not going very quickly on this, but these are the, the, the three formats. And uh, if we get used to this yet. Now, what I just want to do here is to move to the next element that will be in an architectural consideration. And that is the organisation of the parts. We've dealt with the auditorium, so to speak, where the 
engagement takes place. Important to remember that the word parliament comes from the French word parler, to speak. It's a place where people who have disagreed with each other, instead of taking out their swords and, 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 and batons, that they can actually and fight it out to see who wins. Uh, they can now, which is the barbarian way of doing things, they can now move to speaking. So they arrange a parliament, a place where that they can speak together. So the idea is that you already have two opposing factions within the political system, and they want to engage to see if they can find a common ground. So we now have to arrange that in a certain way. And I want to look at the first, the first of, oh, sorry, we'll go back again. Uh, the first one I want to, want to look at here is College Green. College Green, in fact, is seminal because it's the first time a building in modern, in, in modern Western history is built for parliamentary purposes. It's specifically built. This dates from an earlier Chichester house, which in fact had already formulated the idea, I'll come to it in a moment, and we do have, we do have a, a map of Chichester house, as it was, which predated the parliament. That in fact, however, what Pierce was a member of parliament himself, uh, and that also he was, he was related to Van Brew, the English architect, uh, and that he clearly, he clearly was a very talented architect. He was born with it. Talent is something you don't learn, you're born with. He was born with it. It maybe never developed because he died so young, uh, but he certainly showed an enormous level of ability. It's curious that in the, uh, when I was at college, it used to be held that the British Museum had been the model for the Houses of Parliament until somebody pointed out that the Parliament was already nearly 30 years old when the British Museum was conceived. So which led the way is quite clear. This was a seminal building uh, and is probably one of the most important buildings in Ireland when you analyse it on Palladian grounds. Uh, so what Pierce does then is, Pierce creates, first of all, what is very important. Oh, sorry, have I lost it? Have I lost it again? Uh, uh, let me see. College Green, yeah. So at the top one, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, what Pierce does is, the first and most important thing is that Parliament is expected to re represent the people. There's somebody it's representing. A parliamentary representative, a TD, is a person that you elect to speak for you. Now, if he's not going to talk to you and find out what, you, what your interests are, he's not much of a representative. Therefore, there must be a public behind an elected body. And that public must have a degree of access Interestingly enough, we find in the earlier kind of social pattern, we find that it's a request that you must make. You have no absolute rights. You come along and you request, but you request your member of parliament. So what Pierce, do Pierce does here is he makes the entrance hall, the hall of requests. So you enter on the civic axis. You enter through the hall of requests. You come then to what Pierce now emphasizes, which is the commons. That's, un that's interesting and unusual. He subordinates the Lords and he comes to the Commons. This is largely because the Whig majority has by now established, if you like, a second level of land ownership uh, where power, power is vested in land. So you now have a body which begins to override the old hereditary interests, which were titles, inherited titles and so on. Whether you had land or not didn't matter. The main thing was that you had inherited a title. That became relatively hollow, or progressively more hollow. Uh, and that what happened is then the commons became more important. Interestingly enough, Pierce now emphasizes this, which was never emphasized before. Uh, and that he then finds that the, the third element that he brings into it is conference, because he has the lords, the commons, and the conference. Because in fact, the purpose of the lords is slowly relegated to being an advisory chamber. So you have a deciding chamber and an advisory chamber, and they must consult. They have something to bring, certainly, but they are not in control any longer. It's now going to be the Commons. Pierce was a little bit ahead of himself and his times in relation to that, um, and that this would be later defeated when the Un Act of Union takes place and we move to Westminster. Uh, but what we have then is, the other element we have is the civic dome. At this time, urban importance is stressed by the presence of a dome in a civic building and a spire uh, in a religious building. And you have, two, you have two, if you like, contesting interests in urban development. 
the religious and the political. Uh, and that broadly speaking, now that's not, it's not an absolute, the Renaissance changes that to quite a large extent by making the dome, if you like, also a, 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 locus, of, um, a, a locus of religious, a religious centre. Uh, and that in a way, this is almost what the Renaissance does. It takes away from the great Gothic spires uh, and begins to focus back in the dome. All of this is a language. And this is an urban language, and, and that that's really what we're concerned with here. Now, if we go then to Westminster, this is Westminster um, the, uh, as, as, it, as it's developed. It's developed by Pugin and Barry in the 1830s, uh, and eventually kind of is finished in the 1860s, because it's burnt down in the mid-1830s. Uh, however, at the old, the old Westminster Hall, uh, parliament was really just a choir parliament. It was it was the equivalent of a cathedral, where except in these circumstances you had the crown sitting on a platform, and to the left and to the right you had the representatives. This I think was not conceived. This was something that because this was the form of building that they built in at the time Westminster Hall was built. Uh, it therefore follows that pattern. So the building dictates the pattern there. So we have then again the Hall of Requests. Uh, we have then the, um, the vestibule. Now, and what, the, what, 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 uh, what Kent, this is Kent. This was not, this, sorry, I should say, I'm misleading you there. This is not Pugin and Barry. Kent in the 1830s, sorry, 1839. Sorry, 1739. Uh, Pierce had been 1729. Ten years later, Kent does a proposal for Westminster. Westminster hasn't yet been burnt down. He does a proposal. It never gets affected but it becomes very important in terms of international parliament buildings. Because what he does is he has the Hall of Requests again. Now he has a vestibule. He's equating Lords and Commons. Pierce is defining Commons. He's putting the dome then in the center over the vestibule. So he's giving them all, if you like, a quality of parity between them. And then he's keeping conference where it is again here. Um, he. <coughs> Moving on from there, in the meantime, in 1793, uh, there's a competition for the, for, for the capital in Washington, uh, and that Washington is now extremely, extremely concerned because he has 13 member states who all want to be independent. They're fed up of being overruled by somebody. They've just fought a war uh, to, to dispose of the British. The French and the Spanish keep have an eye on them. Um, they're very concerned that they won't be left alone. The last thing they want to do is to come together and form something else. However, Washington convinces them that they should do so for their defense primarily, and he develops the idea of a federation of the states, where in fact the states will elect, uh, if like, a federal government to whom limited powers will be given. The states will reserve their own powers. This is not altogether dissimilar from the current American constitution. They will then develop a constitution in which the various bodies like the Supreme Court and so on will have the ultimate say in relation to matters which affect everybody and everything within the jurisdiction. So Washington is very anxious to have this defined. Jefferson, again, recognizing that there is no historic background to this, um, requires his architects to look to classical Rome. Uh, by the same token, practicality and experience suggest to him that what he must do is he must also take into account uh, what has already been established in the world of parliaments and Kent's parliament now, Kent's de de tends to define it. Again, he has a hall of requests, interestingly enough, in his drawings. Uh, he has the Senate on one side and the House of Representatives on the others. This is no longer to balance, if you like, social interests, it's to balance state interests. The idea of big states and small states as opposed to rich people and poor people. So it's in there's a mechanism there whereby, or the complex mechanism whereby, which exists to the present day, whereby the House of Representatives and the Senate are elected on a different basis. The idea is that put together, they represent a balancing of the interests of the state. So no one state, no powerful state can override the other states. Uh, again, this time he takes the president. The president is now extremely important. The first time we find a president appearing in, uh, in such a plan. And we go from there to conference, which again binds the two together, that they're going, the outcome is always going to be here. Thornton 
Thornton's building was ultimately in various forms built. However, it was finally largely modified uh, and to the current form by Walter in the 1850s. And Walter this time, interestingly enough, for the first time, he no longer calls it a hall of request. He calls it the hall of the people. Now we have a subtle shift in terms of these are the people of the United States. They're not requesting anything. They are dominating, in a sense. They are represented here. And that we have on either side of them, we have the Senate and the representatives. These become, if you like, ancillary areas, uh, progressive areas. They're not functional areas, sculpture galleries, so on, as you go from one to the other. So they add to the grandeur of the building, the original uh, Senate and the original House of Representatives. And then again, you get the ancillary surrounding it. So this is moving then to the 1850s. If we move on then to Westminster, Westminster, Westminster is destroyed in the 1834 fire. Uh, there is then a whole process whereby it is replanned and reconsidered by Barry and Pugin uh, and gets built over a long period of time. That's the building we know today. Uh, and that in that, what it has, interestingly enough, it has, this time he calls it a central hall. So he's now being, if you like, non-committal about it in relation to what it does. He's got the Lords and the Commons roughly equally, equally positioned, except behind the Lords, he puts a Royal Gallery. He now keeps the concept of monarchy as a token here. He has the Royal Entrance here and the Victoria Tower. He also, and I should have mentioned in the others, there's the idea of the library. The library is always annexed to one of these buildings as a seat of learning and that it's going to be available to both houses because both of them are expected to consult uh, authorities. So again, we have a lot of subtle language within this. Um, so we go through the Hall of Requests, and then we go through St. Stephen's Hall, which is really a ceremonial zone, and we're back to the original Westminster Hall from which the Parliament was generated. That's kept here, and again, it's kept not as an essential part, but as an incidental part, historical addendum, which also becomes a multi-purpose or general purpose function within the idea of the Parliament. We then have St. Stephen's Tower, which was the original clerical tower that marked the, that marked the religious input into the medieval Palace of Westminster. Um, so we have then, as I say, a completely new, uh, if you like, iteration of Kent's original idea they're not following. They're not following. Um, they're not following Pierce. They're following Kent. Uh, so now, um, if we look then at uh, Doyle Aaron, which as it stands at the moment, and just compare it to those, and part of the reason I'm going through this is to ask the question: Is Leinster House suitable? Can it be modified to make it work? And one of the tests might be a litmus test to see whether or not it fits into. In fact, the historic developed pattern of parliaments. And I think one can say in relation to historically development patterns, as indeed of all experience, that experience usually is proof that something works. Uh, you don't have to have, you can fit the theory after the event in relation to something that works. If it works, there must be a theory to support it. If there is a theory, it mightn't work. So that the, 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 the Anglo-Saxon approach of which we tend as a Celtic element of it to form a part is usually to try it. And if it works, then find out the reason why. The French approach would be think out the reasons why it should work and then try it, and it probably won't. So I mean, I think so there are two different mentalities embodied even in the patterns that we have, the parliamentary patterns that we have. So we have again the entrance. We have the reception and conference facilities then directly opposite. We have then the Senate and the library. The Senate is over the library. We'll come, we'll come in due course to why that is the case. And then we have the Doyle in here, which by accident of circumstances, and here, if you like, is one of my anticipatory observations that the RDS have created a lecture theatre in what is probably just about the right place. That if you were to come in to convert this building in, into, a, into a government, seat of government, where would you put the, rep the, if you like, the representative chamber um, you probably would have put it into that area there in all of the circumstances, but it's already there. So in a way, the RGS has anticipated us. 
Um, if we go on from there to Stormont, which is an interesting building, because Stormont comes from the Government of Ireland Act in 1921, the North and the South were both offered a Parliament, the Northern Parliament and the Southern Parliament. The idea, again, as I said earlier, was there was to be a federation. Uh, the idea was the two governments, a little bit like the United States, they would have, if you like, a federal uh, government between them in the fullness of time. Uh, however, when Thornley uh, was designing this, he follows the routine pattern. Again, he creates the central hall, the famous one with the staircase up that you see in all of the, all of the pictures. Um, he has the library then, and then uh, he has the commons and the senate on either side. Uh, he has them also, they can be entered independently, which is an interesting approach to it. There's an element of that in Westminster coming from, if you like, the royal side. Uh, however, they, 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 he gives them a quality here. He doesn't choose one or the other. And here we're back to, and Edmund Burke had made an interesting observation, uh, that all history tends towards a quality. In other words, the trend of history is towards equalization between people. Uh, and that what you see happening here is progressively from a dominant unit, a group, within these patterns, you find we now begin to find equality between, between interests. I want to move on from there very quickly to what I would say the first parliament building in Ireland was. Now, we've difficulty identifying it. It was in Kilkenny, and it arose from the Confederation of Kilkenny, which was the Catholic Confederation, and it was a grouping, and one of the first groupings of the both landed interests, both the native interest who had been dispossessed and the landed interest uh, came together because they were Catholic. Ireland had not been affected by the Reformation in the same way, and I'm now talking about the, if you like, the, uh, the, the wealthy population, not in the same way as England had, uh, and you had a large number of Catholic aristocrats in Ireland. They came together with, if you like, the, the, the original, if you like, Gaelic interests, which were still very strong prior to the uh, prior to the Cromwellian, uh, Cromwellian uh, conquest, they were still fairly strong, um, and that they grouped together to form an uncomfortable alliance. There were fundamental differences between them, but their common interest was to support Charles I. Uh, and they did that successfully. It was a total government. It had a constitution, uh, it, which was, you know, yeah, which is known as the Constitution of Kilkenny. Uh, it was very close to, it was probably the first modern constitution of what one might call a democratic state, even though it recognized, uh, tokenly recognized a monarchy. Uh, but for functional purposes, it looked after itself. It was divided into a Lords and a Commons. They didn't sit separately, they sat one above the other in this particular instance. This is not an illustration of that parliament building. We know that, or we believe that it was in a place called She's House, unfortunately now a car park, adjoining the courthouse uh, in Kilkenny. However, all of the historical evidence is in favor of the fact that it was in that house. And we know it was a chamber that was 15 meters square. We also know that it was banked with uh, timber benching on both sides. And we know that the Woolsacker, the Chancellor's seat, was placed at the end of that. So we have, we have written descriptions, we have no verbal description, we have no drawn descriptions of it. But I think it's reasonable to assume that in fact it followed the pattern of what at that stage was Westminster Hall. This in fact is the trial of Stafford, the 1640s. Um, and that you can see in this stage the banking down, the old choir pattern here where you would have had the, the bishop's chair at the top here, uh, or sorry, at the top here, uh, and that you would have had the, 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 the sort of the officials down the center. It was probably very much like that. The description is not distinct from that, except that in this case, while this is the commons only, that in this case there was a barrier here and that these upper seats were, were allowed for what were known as the lords or the aristocratic, yeah, the aristocratic class. This actually very quickly is just of, the, of College Green. Before College Green was there, this is what was there. Chichester House, where the parliament, the original parliament, the first parliament, I'm talking now about the, 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 um, the, the post, as I say, uh, what do you call it? The post 18th century parliament. At the beginning of, at the, beginning of, the, of the 18th century, this is where the parliament sat in Chichester House. 
uh, it was very unsatisfactory, and this is the one that Pierce was asked to modify. This was Pierce's original plan for the Parliament, and as you will see, I've just given you a rough illustration of it, I won't spend very long on it, but as you can see, he chose the octagon, he also had galleries up above it here, and he had the, the, the speaker at one end of it here, he used one of these entrances for the speaker. But the idea really was that they were, if you like, they weren't adversarial, but there was a sufficient degree of flexibility allowed for adversarial crossfire in relation to this. Um, yeah, uh, the House of Lords he had here. Now, Gandon later on comes along. Gandon puts Gandon's portico, very fine Corinthian portico here, and Gandon creates an entrance for the House of Lords. This is the reassertion, if you like, of the privilege, of the idea of privilege in the upgrading of the House of Lords. This remains to the present day. Uh, this was a cross-section through the chamber. And as you will see, as I pointed out at the beginning, the dome, the civic dome in this case, was over the Commons Chamber. So you can see it here above the Commons Chamber, uh, the dome, and you can see you can see the gallery, the gallery around here, and you can see the actual seating, the, the seating arrangements coming down here at the side. Uh, now that's just an illustration of it. It's 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 an uncomfortable foreshortening because it tends to look like a long narrow aisle. That's actually looking into the center of an octagon. So it's somewhat distorted, but nonetheless interesting to see how it was laid out. You can see the gallery, and you can see again Pierce's Venetian window at the back there, which was again part of the classic uh, classic mark. This again, I've, I've, I've outlined you that diagrammatically. This was Kent's proposal, um, and you can see you can see there that the idea the idea of the entrance hall, and you've got the you've got the vestibule or the it, the court of requests in the centre, and you've got the Lords and Commons on each side here. These were merely two variants on Kent's Parliament. This is the one that, even though it wasn't built, that was to become, if you like, the architectural uh, pattern that would be adopted. Uh, if we go then to Thornton's capital, just showing it very quickly here, we have the rotunda, as he calls it here, uh, which is again a very neutral word. Uh, he then has the conference in behind it here with the president in between. He has the senate. He gives the Senate, interestingly enough, the library. I suppose he expects them to be more learned than the people who will be in the House of Representatives, uh, and that this, this would reflect him. This, again, is coming very quickly. I went through it earlier. This is, Walter, um, uh, this is Walter's expansion of that. You can see the original, the original Senate here. You can see the original representatives here. These now become transitional areas on your way through to the House of Representatives and the Senate. Uh, and that this gives that level of grandeur. The Parliament of Westminster, again, uh, I just, I've shown you the diagram of that, but the, what you have then is you have the, ro the, royal, gal you have the, the, ro the royal gallery here, uh, and then you have the, uh, you, co you come through to the, 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 the Lords, and then you come through to the Commons on this side here. Uh, I, again, keeping Westminster Hall as a, a, gen a general functional area, backup area, to it. Uh, Stormont, in fact, as you'll see, follows Kent fairly closely, uh, and that what you'll see again that once you once you once you enter Stormont here, you come again into the into the, the central area here, and then you go to is that upside down? No, I can't read it. Sorry, I'm sorry, it's upside down. <laughs> but I don't know how to turn it around. But you you've you've got you've got the um, the, uh, the, the, the 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 two the two houses here. Uh, the, uh, the, the Senate on one side and the representatives, or at least the, the equivalent of the Commons on the other. And these, these are the subdivisions that are defined in the Government of Ireland Act. These are the functions that are given. I think I'm right, am I right? In the, yeah. These are the functions that are given in, in, in there. And again, you can see they're treated with architectural, um, architectural specificity in relation to equality that both of them are given the same degree of emphasis uh, in terms of the building itself. There's, no, there's nobody dominating here. Interestingly enough, there was to have been a dome here, but I believe it was omitted on grounds of cost. Um, and that um, I, I just, just introduced that in a sense that this is what happened just before uh, the issue of finding a, a suitable, a suitable look, a parliamentary building in, in Dublin. Uh, was undertaken. Now, if we look at Leinster House, 
in relation to, so let's say, a parliament building. It's, it's a bit, it's a bit difficult maybe to see there. We kind of come in here. We find that we have the Doyle Chamber on one side here. Above this, we have the Senate here. We have the library down here. We have the conference rooms. Uh, with the conference rooms across here. So that to a large extent, we're now seeing very much the pattern as before. I just put this up as a matter of passing interest. You can see that it wasn't only in these islands and in the English speaking world that this idea of equality of representation uh, and if you like centrality, the centrality uh, of the public interest and the idea of impressiveness uh, and of having, if you like, what Alberti would say, would be a civic centre to which all citizens precipitate or they're drawn as by magnetism towards that. So that you find that that's, that's happening abroad as well. And maybe one of the best examples of that is the parliamentary. We then come to Leinster Lawn and we find that in 1853, there was an exhibition uh, that, that's been referred to earlier. Now, what we have, I think maybe before before going, that's not a particularly good slide. That's not much better. Um, I'll just leave that one there for a second. I want to go very quickly through just a sequence. It's already been mentioned, and I just want to mention it for the purposes of specificity. Um, and that that is, first of all, we had the Electoral Reform Acts of 1832, 1867, and 1918. Those completely changed the political landscape because prior to 1832, the ordinary people, who were 99% of the people, had absolutely no say in what was done. All power was vested in a tiny percentage of, if you like, people who were protected by, if you like, title, uh, by the crown. It was the way the crown exercised power. We have the devolution of power. By 1832, we find that uh, we have an electoral act where, in fact, people who are lesser property owners are now admitted uh, to the electorate. So they have an importance now. People who are less important in, in pre-1832 become more important. What do I mean by important? That in fact they are relevant to electorates and therefore if, you, if you're their representative uh, you can make the decisions that affect them and that if you don't make the right decisions they won't choose you the next time. So there's a kind of a mutual interest, there's a scales there whereby one is balanced against the other. 1867, that's considerably widened. That's widened, in fact. Again, it's a male, it's very much a male electorate, but it's moving down the scale to much lower property levels. So now you have a much bigger electorate. Your political policies must address them. They will elect people who, in fact, are not your type as far as up to now has been concerned. They are a different type of people. Now we have the perfect makings for an opposition. And we see, we see kind of labour coming on the horizon. The first sail that appears in the distance on the horizon for labour uh, occurs in 1867. From 1867 on, you have, the, you have the, uh, the, principally the First World War. That changes the pattern completely. After that, women are not taking any more nonsense. They're going to be added to the electorate. After that, people who are relatively small property owners, they still have an interest in a say. They're still paying taxes, and it's the people who are paying taxes now who should be making the choices, not the people who are assigned power by the crown. So bit by bit, the, 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 the traditional element of uh, privilege shrinks, and the idea of the masses increase. So we then have another huge intervention. Eight, nine, in 1793 and in 1829, we have Catholic emancipation. Now Catholics, in fact, from 1873, Catholics can vote. In Ireland, they're a huge part of the, of the electorate. Now, admittedly, they're still restricted in terms of property ownership, but that will disappear as time goes on. And by the time we get to 1918, that will be gone, uh, and that Catholics will be the same as everybody else up to now. That particular counter-revolution will be over. Uh, so, we have then this widening, a widening political class by 1918. That is people who are entitled to elect representatives. We then have the Land Acts between 1881 and 1903. We heard some of that this morning. Uh, these completely change land ownership. And with land ownership comes interest 
In other words, interest in the stability of society, interest in the progress of society. And more and more, the original people are creeping back. And I want just to revert back for one moment to a short, a very short uh, extract from a very interesting book, a book I've only seen one copy of it in my lifetime, and it's by a man called John Gamble, who was a, a doctor, a medical doctor in the north of Ireland, who in the year 1810 made a trip through Ireland and maintained, if you like, a diary, very well written, of what he saw. So you're no longer seeing things from a highfalutin political level with an interest behind it. What you're actually seeing now is you're seeing, you're seeing somebody who's looking at this and telling you what he sees. And that he says, the change in property, and this is, this is 1810, the change in property in Ireland is almost inconceivable. The descendants of the ancient inhabitants are now only the dregs of the people. The wheel of human affairs is perpetually turning and no person can tell where its revolution may bring them again. And I would say, where its revolution brought them again was to Leinster House, uh, which moved then from being, if you like, the residence of the first citizen. By privilege, that's why he was first citizen. He was also a man who had nationalist sympathies. He was promoted by the nation, uh, by the people. He supported them. And he was seen both in America and in, in Ireland as being perhaps a little bit too much of the color of the native people. He represented the real ascendancy uh, in Ireland who were Irish, an Irish ascendancy. So what we have then is we have the, 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 the movement towards equality. We're back to Burke Strand again. Then Gladstone sees something, ex, something is very important now. And as I said earlier, we can track this by legislation. Gladstone sees that if you're going to have an electorate like that, you need to educate them. They're going to demand it, and you, uh, they need it, and you need them to be educated. He introduces the Education Act in 1870, and he creates a level of literacy never seen or heard before. From now on, you're going to have a literate population. Now, the 1853 exhibition, which we have heard about earlier, that in fact triggered an interest. A lot of paintings were lent for that. They were very important paintings and still are very important paintings. And there was a view after that that, in fact, this should be consolidated. Uh, already we had the issue that the RDS were pressing for a natural history museum. They had too much to display. There was this whole idea, which now equates with this statutory background. You have a population that's educated. They need access to the facilities for educated people. They need access to museums. They need access to galleries. They need access to, access to cultural institutions. So there's now a field and a demand for them. And the Great Exhibition then brings about that. And that in 1857, we have the Natural History Museum is built. I won't, I won't delay on the National Gallery. We've gone through that and we've heard about that this morning. That opens in 1864. It's by uh, Fuchs uh, and Lanyon has an involvement in that as well. Now, we then get the report, on sci uh, the report of the Science and Art Commission in 1868. And what they actually say, it is uh, in their report in 1868, it is desirable that certain institutions be concentrated in the convenient locality forming a group, a museum of science and art, a public library, a museum of natural history, a museum of antiquities, a national gallery, and a school of art. Now, that was the, that's, that, that, sorry, that's, that's not the plan. That, or that, that, I'll come to that plan in a moment. But they, 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 they issued a plan we saw earlier uh, just showing the kind of level. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. That is the plan I'm referring to. That's the plan that appears in the report. That's taken from the parliamentary report. Uh, and that what they're showing as a proposal for the National Gallery is that it be built along the front of Merrion Square. As you can see, the two, they, we already, by now, we have the Natural History Museum, we have the gallery, we have Leinster House at the back, and they were going to close the square with a face onto Merrion Square and a face onto Leinster Lawn. Uh, and th this was their proposal. Um, Pembroke, who actually owned the lease of the ground, objected. Uh, and that the Department of Arts and Science, and 18, the, the, the authors of the 1878 report, they actually, what they say is, we cannot but regret it was felt that the loss of a few flower beds would be far more than compensated by a handsome, commodious, well-lighted science and art museum. So I think that was putting Pembroke back in his place in relation to that. 
Um, the government was in, oh yeah, the next thing then, what they decided to do was that they would go on to the other side. We saw that this morning. Uh, yeah, sorry, that's, that's, the, that's the, 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 the other map of the land acquisition. Uh, that they will go on to the other side. We've seen a version of this here, but they will go on to the Kildare Street side and that they would build, a, um, they would build the, the museum there uh, and that they, they went and they appointed an architect. There was an uproar about that. Uh, no Irish architect was premiated. We've heard that this morning. Uh, and that the way that they got around that, they knew that they were in political trouble at that stage, particularly as a museum related to a culture. And by now you had this growing Gaelic revival, that which was going to ultimately, Griffiths was going to bring forward and use as the, 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 the flag for the 1916 rebellion. That was already rising at this stage. And that what we have now is we have uh, the decision to build a museum, which in fact locks this culture permanently in to the interests of the people, going to be designed by a foreign architect, not acceptable. And I think it does, I don't, I think it was more, to be fair, we heard this morning this was more about architects looking for work. I'm not so sure that it necessarily was. I think there was something in the nationalist ethos of the time deeper than that. It actually outraged, and that was immediately recognised and accepted by the, the powers that be. Uh, and that uh, what they decided to do then was, uh, in order to overcome their embarrassment, uh, was to cancel the competition on the grounds that they'd rewritten the brief. And the rewriting of the brief was to add a public library. So it was now, it was now a scheme which was doubled and the, you couldn't reasonably say the competition for the first one should be just extended. So it gave them a beautiful political excuse and Dublin benefited in the process by getting a library out of them. So that in fact they decided to hold this. This is where we get uh, Thomas Dean. He uses the, it's an anonymous, of course competitions are anonymous, and that what he writes at the bottom of it as his, if you like, pseudonym is Cromaboo. And Cromaboo was the war cry of the Fitzgeralds. Uh, so, as O'Donnell Abu was, was for, for, for O'Donnell. So, he, in a sense, it may well certainly have been recognised that it would only be an Irish architect who would put that in. So, I think probably, probably it was read sort of between the lines that that was the case. Um, <laughs> Oh, gosh. Uh, um, okay, well, what Dean does is he turns the building effectively into uh, a public building by what he does. I mean, there may be various criticism of parts of it as it now, as it now stands, but he turns the building in, into a public building. Uh, but one other parallel... Let's, let's just go back there. Yeah, one other parallel um, that, that was going to be important uh, in, in relation to this was that Horace Plunkett... In the meantime, who was a very, he, he was the son of Lord Dunsany. Uh, he had been a, an MP. He was, he was a member of the first Senate when the Senate was created, the Irish Senate was created. He had effectively instigated a Department of Agriculture and Technical Instruction in Ireland. And he became the vice president of it. And he succeeded in getting the funds for a new building, which is the, the agricultural building and the College of Science that we have seen earlier. He succeeded in getting the funds of that for that department. That was, as you say, the last, um, Aston Webb was the architect for it, but um, why he chose Aston Webb, I'm not clear, but he did, uh, and that this was, if you like, the, the, the last trumpet of the, of the empire in relation to, I think that's a fair comment. However, this building was, while the College of Science was in occupation, the Agriculture, Department of Agriculture was not in 1921. And so I'll go very quickly through this. I'm, I spent far too long on the early part of this, I'm afraid. But what we will say that, I should have said that Dean in the process was asked to do a theatre uh, to, uh, to, for the RDS. And the RDS then got this theatre, which was in its day the most modern facility in the country, seated 700 people and so on. Now, um, we, we go through the whole issue of the treaty. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go through that now. I've, I've, I've let myself far too short. Um, and that uh, we, we go through the whole issue of the treaty. Uh, the treaty, in fact, then effectively results in the Treaty Act of 1921, which is a, an act of the British Parliament, uh, and that that effectively prorogues or uh, cancels out the incohate parliament, which was set up 
under the 1920 Act. The Parliament of 1920 had been set up under what was known as the Convention. The Convention was an attempt by Lloyd George to get the parties to meet. Sinn Féin refused to take their seats in the Convention. It was chaired by Horace Plunkett. The Convention proposed a northern, uh, sorry, proposed a single state, uh, more or less a free, uh, back to the 1914 Act, uh, very simply a Home Rule Act. Uh, De, Valera, De Valera and Co. completely rejected that. They used the elections of 1918, and uh, they said they would create their own parliament as a result of those. They did that in the Mansion House. That parliament became the first, if you like, legitimate parliament. Lloyd George, who was a Celt after all himself, a Welshman, and I think there was a slight sort of sly kind of appreciation of the, the Celtic movements in him, uh, and that he reckoned that the only people he could deal with were the elected representatives who, in fact, represented the majority of the people. Therefore, it was legitimate politically for him to engage with them. He engages with them. The treaty, the civil war, all that follows. Collins comes to look at Leinster House. Collins decides it's a highly defensible building. He looks, I, I, I would have gone through all the other options they looked at. College Green, there was an instinct against that. There are a number of observations made by Cosgrave who takes over when Collins is killed and Griffith dies within, within a few days of each other. Uh, then Cosgrave takes over. Cosgrave wants to, to maintain the promises that were made by the others. Uh, Cosgrave, in fact, doesn't want to go to College Green. It's too much associated, as he says, with the people who sold their birthright. Uh, there were strong arguments given as to why it should be used, but ultimately, the, probably the final observation made was made by Ernest Bly, who came in and said he did not want to go to the Cutthroat's house. He would prefer to stay where he was. So that was the end for the moment of College Green. College Green wasn't really considered seriously after that. Um, that was just the, the Royal Hospital was considered. That was the lecture theatre. As you see, the Doyle itself, the chamber, it was highly suitable for a chamber. It worked very well. Uh, ultimately, the Senate moved into the ballroom. Uh, the, the, the ballroom, in fact, that was the orchestra stand event in the original house. Uh, for a ballroom, which is the upper floor, the, 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 uh, the upper saloon, uh, and that in 1924 that was made into the Senate and that that was the drawing of the Senate. The Senate had prior to that been in what was an antique furniture department uh, in the museum. So they moved there and that it was found to be satisfactory. I was going to talk, I can't do it now, but maybe another day, I was going to talk about the grand scheme. Devil here heard this grand scheme of acquiring the whole of these areas that are marked, which is the Merrion Square, demolishing all of Merrion Square, building something equivalent to the Belgian capital and the Washington Triangle. He was going to demolish it all the way back to Bagot Street uh, and that he was going to give the cultural institutions back to the RDS so that they would be associated with it. He wanted the cathedral on the north side of Merrion Square, where the institute is behind that. However, in the meantime, the problem was the archbishop had acquired the title to Merrion Square in 1930. The archbishop wanted to put a metropolitan cathedral into Merrion Square. They locked horns and neither of them won. Both of them backed off. What happened was uh, De Valera lost power, the war intervened. <clears throat> there were a whole series of other difficulties uh, Tlana Gale came back and the whole thing, it, it all fell apart. So that never went ahead. Air raid shelters were built in Leinster Lawn and in Merrion Square. Phoenix Park was considered by Raymond McGrath. 1948, Ireland declares it's going to be a republic. The history to that is extremely interesting and how in 1937 we got the constitution was extraordinarily clever. De Valera was extremely clever. The way he played off the British system and managed to succeed. Uh, because what would have happened if de Valera didn't agree is that Edward, the, whatever he was, the seventh, would have remained King of Ireland, but he wouldn't have been. So de Valera traded it and said, let us out and you don't need our vote. And so eventually the British looked at it and they decided in 1937 it was more important that in fact they maintain their system rather than that they actually, uh, that, 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 that they let them lose Ireland, it didn't matter from the Commonwealth. So Ireland left the Commonwealth. 1948, for various reasons, it's not declared in 37, largely to try and bring the North in. Doesn't work. 1948, what we have then is, we have a, a republic is declared, and in 1948, in 1949, the republic comes into effect. It is legislated for in England, accepted in England, and Victoria in 1948, that should be 1948, no, 1948, Victoria statue is removed as being inappropriate to the front. She finished up eventually in, in Sydney in Australia. 
some of the some of the statues around her base kind of they were in storage. They're back now in Leinster House again. They've returned. We've got the fountain. I was just going to say a very elegant building. Uh, that's the House of Lords as it remains today in the case of the Bank of Ireland. Beautiful interiors and that Benjamin Franklin came and visited and he was completely bowled over. And when he went back to America, he, he, he couldn't stop telling them uh, you know, about the, the finest parliament building in the world. Uh, Leinster Lawn, beautiful building, very elegant house in itself. Interiors, marvellous interiors, just as good, I think, as they are in the, the Bank of Ireland. I mean, that's even the basement of it. Uh, so we have the lands, those were the lands then that were acquired at the various stages. And finally, we have this very fine Palladian building. And so I suppose it's a question of closing there uh, and saying that uh, the, the, in, in conclusion, the question is, why, why do we keep it? I think the answer, what I've attempted to show you there, although I've had to, I've had to jump over a lot of things, but, uh, attempt, but my attempt there was to show you that that building actually, against the pattern of Parliament developments in architectural terms, works. It can work. It does work. Uh, does it present within the city? The, as the core of cult, the cultural nucleus of the city is found there, through that kind of history we've heard this morning and through what I've outlined here, cultural institutions are locked in there. Other capitals in Europe have certain... Uh, Luxembourg has an element of this, other, other cities have elements of it. We're the only one that has them all. They're all there together. And that we come back to Alberti's vision, that in fact, the citizen entering a metropolis should be drawn towards that centre, uh, the, 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 the centre of culture uh, and the centre, as he says, where, where, uh, where, 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 where all is static. I just finished now, Dennis. <laughs> um, so it says, uh, so what I'm saying is Leinster House now sits, at, now sits within the metropolis as a matron uh, to the cultural civic institutions and as a seat of government of an independent people. In Alberti's conception, it presents the political and cultural centre of the metropolis in which its first and second lives by circumstances of fate and unexpected turns more than adequately entrained as seen in retrospect and anticipated the third and probably final life of Leinster House, from the residence of the first citizen to the centre of enlightenment of a people, to the seat of government forming the nucleus of the capital which it now forms. And then I would just close by pointing, just referencing to Churchill's famous observation, the House of Commons was bombed in 1941 and devastated. Churchill made the famous comment when he said he wanted it restored in its exact form. He said that our, yeah, we shape our buildings and then they shape us. And I think to a certain extent we can say the same here, that that is a sequence of the interaction between the polity of a people uh, and their govern, how they're governed. In fact, we chose, we chose it and it now dictates to us. And I think that that's right. I think it, it tends to lend credibility to Burke's idea that there is a tendency in history, despite its twists and unexpected turns, somehow or other, it tends, that which survived tends to lead towards the idea uh, of universal equality. And I would just say in closing that both Fitzgerald, the Duke of Leinster, and Washington, who emulated him in the White House design as the first citizen of a people, this would cause them, I think, a smile that this has been achieved. Thank you.